Let's talk about good patterns used in software engineering. This book is used quite a lot. It's called Design Patterns, or also referred to as the Gang of Four book, because it's uh, uh, been written by four authors. It's published in around 1995 and summarizes the developments made in the 80s and 90s about object-oriented uh, languages, methods, uh, tools, and, and whatnot. Uh, but uh, people did quickly recognize that uh, object orientation is nice, but it does not make design knowledge explicit. So they looked into architectural patterns. And in architecture, like real architecture, not computer architecture, you have like catalogs of things like, you know, door, window, arch, and stuff like this. And then uh, they've composed a similar catalog of 23 uh, patterns and each of them was a named abstraction of a recurring solution. The claim of recurrence they've made from their own experience and the fact that it's named now and that just about everybody has read this book, it makes this uh, 23 names very useful in, uh, in discussing design and in, in explaining the design of your uh, particular system to, to fellow programmers. So, discovery of design patterns uh, is not automated in any way, uh, but uh, as, a, as a software engineer you should be able to, to do this. When you have done similar things a couple of times, you can identify some, some building blocks that you're always using. You can find a pattern in, uh, in the solutions uh, or in variants of solutions that you have implemented. And then you record the pattern in order to, uh, uh, to communicate it with, uh, uh, with other people. The application of a design pattern goes the other way around. You face a problem, you think that there should be a pattern, you use Google or you open this, uh, this book to search for a pattern. Then you try to understand everything. So in the book there are quite long uh, descriptions of you know, all kinds of consequences, all kinds of considerations that you should have when you are using a particular pattern. And then you hack it up. An example of such a pattern is the bridge pattern, which is used when you need to decouple uh, abstractions or interface and, uh, and implementation of something. And then basically you have like two hierarchies. One is your 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 interface, your your abstraction, uh, with you know one or more classes that that refine it. But then there is this operation thing, and the actual algorithm behind this operation that's encapsulated in a different uh, object, in a different class. And then you have like uh, subclasses uh, there as well. And uh, you know it allows you to avoid permanent binding between the interface and implementation. It's uh, not like super flexible in a sense that you don't have runtime extension, but you do have much more flexibility than you, when you have when you really hard code the several, uh, several operations or several ways to execute an operation on a, in one thing. Uh, when you look purely at the UML diagrams, then you will might notice that uh, patterns called state and strategy have exactly the same UML diagrams. It means that you know technically there are also you know two uh, two R hierarchies of uh, classes, and one class uses uh, uh, the other one, but they are uh, they are different conceptually uh, so that's why the patterns themselves are different because the description is different considerations are different trade-offs and so forth but the solutions technically are uh, the same so there are some other examples so creational patterns that are about you know how to make uh, objects and uh, uh, out of uh, classes an abstract uh, factory allows you to decouple creation and utilization and make them uh, independent. Uh, factory method does uh, uh, creation based on inheritance. Uh, prototype uh, allows you to create objects quite flexibly and singleton. Uh, it happens when you have like only one instance of a particular class, but you want to have global access to it. Uh, there are structural design patterns, which makes you structure uh, your, your class or your class diagram. 
uh, breach we have seen uh, uh, composite it's uh, uh, when you have uniform part hole structure and decorator when you need to um, be able to extend the behavior of your uh, of your class on the fly so state we've talked about it a little bit it's about finite state machines uh, strategy when you have like uh, uh, algorithm that you uh, change dynamically uh, command is when you have um, uh, when you want to vary the number of methods that you have in your uh, in your object also dynamically uh, mediator when you have like coordination between objects that you want to make very explicit and visitor is when you need to traverse data structures that are not uh, uniform which means they also have their own hierarchies of data Implementation pattern book came out uh, several years after that and uh, it was also a catalog of much lower level patterns. Uh, some of them then became like really detectable by, uh, uh, by automation, uh, by, a, by a meta program for example. And uh, these, uh, the, these were things like control flow, like when, when you uh, when you first do this and then you do that. It's usually associated with uh, imperative programming, but it doesn't have to be because, I mean, even, even Haskell has this do uh, construct with, uh, 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 with uh, complete control over your uh, control flow. And things like double dispatch, when you have like uh, several uh, uh, hierarchies of uh, classes and then you have methods that are usually called something like Compared, compare with or combine with, uh, and then you define them for uh, classes that are, uh, for objects that are higher in the in a hierarchy and lower in a hierarchy, and then you with with every call you get somewhat more information about uh, what's going on, and then usually it's kind of when when you have two objects you go hands and forth, and after you have done that you. Uh, uh, you can already figure out what to do together with uh, the two objects of particular uh, classes that uh, that you have, instead of you know really explicitly f uh, asking who are you and what uh, what do I do with you, and patterns like initialization you know when you uh, when there is th there are some steps that you need to take after uh, physical creation of an object before it really becomes operational. And even subclass, and this is this is implementation pattern. So this is when you really uh, go a bit deeper in in detail, but you still think of uh, these patterns as a way to communicate your ideas to uh, fellow programmers. Then there are some really enterprise or uh, architectural uh, patterns, and this is stuff like model view controller. So if you've used uh, Angular or Ember then you know what it is and that's basically a, uh, such, a, such a paradigm of user interaction when you decouple like internal representation of your uh, uh, of the stuff that's going on and that's your model uh, from what is what is given to uh, uh, the user that's the view and from you know how, how they are uh, coupled and it's your your controller so then uh, you use your view to communicate with the user and the user then uses controller to manipulate the model and the model updates the view and you know the view uh, gives the uh, closes the loop and shows the user what uh, what the effect was uh, but also uh, things like embedded value are uh, architectural patterns here so embedded value is when you have like a um, a record in your in your database that has lots of fields but some of these fields are really should be used together and they form a, a separate uh, uh, class and that class is then uh, I know included in in a bigger class which is uh, representing the entire record and that's an embedded value and gateways when you have like a, a, a class or a set of classes uh, like an API to uh, uh, to perform certain uh, certain things to encapsulate uh, uh, their API from uh, uh, from the use, 
And then you have a couple of attempts uh, that are really fresh, uh, only only uh, existing for a couple of years, to have even smaller patterns. So there are milli patterns that uh, exist on the library level or on a package level, any any kind of uh, level of several interconnected uh, classes. And these are things like API uh, design relevant when you have like the ID should be always the first argument or always the last. Or uh, the, there is a published interface. So published interface is basically when, when it's public, but it's not just public. You also know that there is some third party uh, thing that is heavily depending on it. So it is public, but you also you shouldn't change it uh, a lot or even at all. Uh, micro patterns exist on class level, and these uh, uh, make some observations about the the nature of a class. It's something like uh, okay, this is an interface, so it's an abstract class, and it has no members, so it's only used in order to couple things together, but not. Uh, the, the reuse aspect of subclassing is, is missing here. Uh, or it's, a, it's an, uh, a class that has some fields, but uh, the, the fields of an instance are assigned once during uh, uh, initialization and never changed. And nano patterns, they exist on the level of a method or procedure. So it's something like uh, this, this method takes no argument or returns no argument, it's a void method. Or it's, uh, it has no if statements and there, there are no branches, it just goes straightforwardly from the beginning to the end. Or it writes values to an error, reads early, uh, errors to an array, or makes an array, stuff like this. And all these things, they can be, uh, they can be used in, on different artifacts uh, in software, not just in, in object-oriented uh, uh, paradigm. So, um, I know, grammars, models, all these things can have, uh, can have some uh, patterns, and they can be used quite, uh, in quite interesting ways. But usually when you talk about patterns, you need uh, a couple of things. So something like recognition. They, sh they should be recognizable. The design patterns should be recognizable by uh, you know, designers and, and uh, uh, programmers. Uh, and you know, implementation and micro patterns, they are even recognizable by, uh, automatically uh, recognizable by tools. They should serve some, some purpose. They should be prevalent in the code. They should be uh, simple and kind of limited in scope, uh, uh, which is extremely true for um, for micro patterns and then other smaller patterns. But for bigger ones, it's also they should you know conceptually be limited to a couple of concerns that really have direct uh, relation to uh, uh, to the main uh, to the main point of the pattern. Uh, and they should be evidently used, so they should not be invented, they should be discovered. Uh, there are still some problems in the pattern world. Uh, one of the biggest ones is choosing the right one, because there are quite a lot of them, and I mean, there are 23 of these design patterns in the book, uh, but there are also quite a lot of, uh, you know, architectural and implementation patterns, and just other patterns that exist, uh, uh, you know, in certain domains, and so forth. And quite a lot of them are similar, so it's uh, very hard to choose the, the right one. It takes, takes some experience. Uh, speaking of experience, some people have uh, become some, like over-enthusiastic about patterns and then they kind of try to base their, pattern, uh, base their solution always on a pattern and on as many patterns as, as possible or use the last one that they have learned yesterday. Uh, you know, patterns should be used when they uh, when they give you some some good things, and you, you shouldn't make uh, uh, using a pattern a, a point for uh, always in your uh, in your software uh, engineering. Uh, as I as I've told a couple of times, kind of between the lines, uh, the Gang of Four book is very much. Uh, uh, bias towards object-oriented uh, uh, patterns and actually the very specific kind of object orientation something between C++ and, and Smalltalk something that the authors had immense experience with but there are other languages that do uh, object orientation differently or even work within different paradigms and then some patterns just don't work there or they, they 
exist naturally in the language and you don't need a special pattern to, to make them. And of course pattern discovery it remains an, an open question because uh, uh, because it requires experience and it requires people really thinking hard. So it is design and it's a hard part of design.